Good afternoon, everyone. So today we'll be doing section 12.4, 12, 12.5, and 12.6. If you have any questions on the 12.1 and 12.3 material, it could be a textbook problem, problem set question, or just a concept, please feel free to attend a class. I'll leave some time to go over that stuff with you. I'll do that every class, you know, so if you have questions, just wait for the end. I'll be able to go over that stuff. So 12.4 is titled the cross product. I'll put that up here. 12.4, the cross product. The cross product. And it's the cross product of two vectors. And the cross product of two vectors okay. is a vector. The dot product of two vectors was not a vector, was it? Scalar. Scalar. The dot product of two vectors was a scalar. The cross product of two vectors is a vector. All right. So this Irish mathematician is the guy, I think Hamilton, he invented this thing. But the easiest way to find it is through making a matrix and finding something called a determinant. So I'm going to do that. Um, and I'll make up two vectors. Let's say I got the vector. Um, Vector A is, um, let's say, 1, 4, 3. Let's say vector B is uh, 0, negative 2, 1. And what we're going to find is vector A cross vector B. We'll find that. Well, what we can do is find something called a Determinant of a matrix. <laughs> so at the top, everyone, I'm just going to put down I, J, K at the top of the matrix. I'll put the vector A, all their components right underneath it. And then I'll put vector B's components underneath this. Now, if you have knowledge of matrices, you've worked with matrices before, then you know what a determinant is, and probably already know how to find it. But it's real easy to find the determinant of a matrix. So I'm going to put an equal sign here and leave these three slots open for our cross product. The cross product of two vectors, and we make that cross. It's just like an X. It's a cross. The cross product of two vectors is a vector. So how do you do this? Well, when you're finding a determinant of a matrix, and this is a matrix, to find this first component, we wipe out the first column. That's what we do. We actually cross it out. We don't look at it. And you go to this value right here. See that 4? And we do this times this minus this times this. So if I had like, I'm going to go to like an A, B, C, D. Every time you're going to do A, B minus B, C. Every time we do this. So you can always just say all we're going to do is do A times D minus B times C. And that's the value we're going to put in this first slot. So I'm going to wipe this out. Well, it's 4 times 1. Subtract negative 2 times 3. And for the first time, I should probably write that out, <laughs> just so everyone sees that. What is 4 times 1 subtract negative 2 times 3? That's the value going right there. What do you all get? 10. So it's always A, D minus B, C. This times this minus this times this. I give them A, B, C. You know what? I'm going to go all the way down to the third component. I think I'll skip over the middle component for now. So for the first component, I'm going to find that I wiped out the first column, right? Well, I'm going to keep doing this. What about that third component? Wipe out the third column. Oh. Wipe out the third column. And that times that minus that times that. A, D minus B, C. And you could probably do it in your head. Negative 2 is that product. 0 times 4 is 0. What's negative 2 minus 0? Negative 2. So far, so good? Yeah, find a cross product. It's rather easy, but you'll notice something. It does take a little more thinking and math than a dot product. Dot product's fast. But this take, you got to do this three times, so it's actually a little bit more complicated. Well, for this last one, I'm going to star this. Because 
when it comes to finding a determinant of a matrix, we do the same thing, but we always change the sign of the second value. We'll always change the sign. We'll do the same thing, and I'll just change the sign of my result. If I get a positive, I'll make it negative. If I get a negative, I'll make it positive. I'm really just putting a negative one on it. And that's what we always do for the middle component. So, I'm going to wipe out this middle column. A, D minus B, C. Whatever I get from my result, I'm going to change the sign. Or rather, just put a negative on it. So, 1 times 1 minus 3 times 0. Alright. 1 times 1 minus 3 times 0. But what do we always do for this middle component? We multiply a negative 1 to it, right? We're going to assign a negative value to this, changing the sign. What's the overall result? Negative. That's the cross product. So I'm going to write it really big here. A cross B is the vector. 10, negative 1, negative 2. All right. And this is huge, everyone. This is very powerful. I know that's the definition of this vector, you know, from that mathematician Hamilton, but this is what's huge. The cross product of two vectors is orthogonal to each vector. The cross product of each, the cross product of A cross B, that cross product, is going to be orthogonal to vector A and orthogonal to vector B. When I say that word orthogonal, think perpendicular. All right? So if I took a um, so you're saying together. like A and B are perpendicular to each other? No, A and B are not perpendicular to each other unless that dot product was zero. Okay. We can check it real quick. It could be. Let's just check. Is A perpendicular to B? The dot product would have to be what? Zero. zero. Okay. So it isn't, is it? No. No, but this is always the case. Let's just say vector A and vector B must occupy some plane in space. I'll use my table. Vector A and vector B must be occupying some plane some plane somewhere in space. Well then, the cross product of those two vectors will always be perpendicular to the plane occupied by those two vectors. Oh, the always. cross product. Okay. Yep, the cross product will always be perpendicular to that plane occupied by those two vectors. So it will be perpendicular to this vector, it will be perpendicular to this vector. Okay. Now let's, let's show that. Oh, let's show that. You know what that would mean? Do you all agree? The dot product of this vector with this vector should be zero. That's what it means. And the dot product of this vector with this vector should be one. So let's check it. I'll be honest, I check this every time whenever I do a cross product. Because my eyes, I'm looking all over the place. Where are we looking at all the different columns? So I'll try, I'll try to rush it. <laughs> I'll try to rush it. And sometimes I'm like, I want to make sure I didn't look at the wrong column. So let's try this. What's the dot product of this? The vector A, it should be 0. 10 times 1 plus <laughs> negative 1 times 4 plus negative 2 times 3. Is that 0? Yes. Check. And then the other one. 10 times 0. 0. 0. Plus negative 1 times negative 2. Plus 2. Plus negative 2 oh, times yeah. 1. It's the dot product 0 in both cases. Then you're absolutely certain you did the cross product right. And I'll be honest, me as a math, I always check it. And the reason I always check to make sure I did the problem right, because when I'm doing a cross product, you saw it, I'm going like this and going this type, this and this and this. And I'm going here and this type, this. I easily, you know, I can start like just wandering with my thoughts. I mess something up, so I always check it. Does cross product always have to be applied to three dimensional? Can it be on two? two it has to be three dimensional is a brilliant question. You go, what if it's a two dimensional vector? Well, if you got the i and j, then just make k a zero. Oh. Like if you're in a two dimensional plane. But it always has to be a three-dimensional vector, the cross product. Wasn't true with dot product, was it? No. Well, with the cross product, it has to be three-dimensional. And you go, well, what if I want to deal with something in the xy plane? Well, in the xy plane, z is equal to what? Zero. Just make them zeros. So it's cool, and this is huge. So this will always be perpendicular, right, to the two vectors. Now, um, we could do all the math, but a lot of you probably know about this. What if we did B cross A? Well, I would have put the B here, and then I put the A here, and I would do all the math, but I bet you could predict the answer. You know what happened to all these? 
they would all be the opposite sides. Because that vector has to be what? Orthogonal to both of them, right? Mm -hmm. You can do all the math. You can go in there and do all the math, but you would find it would be the same answer, but all the signs would be what? And so remember about my table? Remember I said, everyone, here's my two vectors occupying some plane. The cross product of the two vectors is orthogonal or perpendicular to that plane, perpendicular vector. Then the other vector must be going in the total opposite what? Direction. Direction. So I'm going to take this and slip it underneath the table. Right. That just means you, that, that's why they all got assigned negatives. Does that, that make sense? Mm -hmm. so a cross B, B cross A, they're always going to be reversed in terms of sign. Cool. But when you do A cross B, you always put the A vector here and the B vector there. So if they ask you to do find U cross V, they want you to put U there and then V there. And after a while, everyone, you're going to find it silly to keep writing these IJs and Ks. Do we need them? So you're probably not even going to write these. You'll probably just do this and do the math. Cool. Awesome. All right. Hey, um, so that's a cross product of two vectors. But the cross product of two vectors will always be orthogonal to each vector. Well, here comes our next theorem. Um, we'll prove some stuff today, but we're not going to prove this theorem. Again, it's one of those theorems that the proof's in the book. This one we won't prove, but this is the magnitude of a cross product. is equal to the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the sine of theta. In terms of formulas in 12.4, there's not many. Formulas are theorems, but that's a huge one. Oh, so this is not cos, this is sine. I know, and I'm going to write that above this. We just did a theorem last class that looks like this, but it had a dot product. I want to write it right up because it helps you remember it. Look. It was a dot product. It equals the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of theta. And yes, that angle theta, everyone, is the angle between the two vectors. If you want to add this, I won't write it on the board. This theorem right here, I know theta can only be between 0 and pi in terms of radians. If you want to add that. I put it on the formula sheet. I remember the formula sheet I handed out? I made a note of that. So if you just want to put a little note that that angle there would have to be between 0 and 180 degrees or between 0 and pi radians. Can it be equal to 0 pi? Yes, it can. Yes, very good. What other questions you would say? It could have equal it. Because I said the word between. Uh -huh. She wanted to know, is it inclusive? Can you use those endpoints? Okay. Like a closed bracket. And it's like, yes, it can. Yeah, can, you can go all the way from that. And that's for this one. I don't think it's going to be something that will bug you, but... You know, we should be very specific. Hey, doesn't that look like that? The only thing, this didn't have a magnitude, did it? No. Cool. Awesome. Well then, if that's equal to this, this we can prove. Then this must be equal to the area of a parallelogram that occupies Oh, we'll prove this because that'll be a piece of cake. Now we have a theorem. So let's draw a picture. You know, in a parallelogram, you know, opposite sides are parallel. It's a quadrilateral, but the opposite sides are parallel. How about let's call this vector A and let's call that vector B. This is going to be a quick proof. <laughs> now, in the magnitude, of the cross product of two vectors A and B in some parallelogram, just like that, must mathematically equal the what? Area. The area inside the parallelogram. Now this is huge because that means in three-dimensional space we can determine like the area of some parallelogram way out there. Well, let's prove it. Um, well, to get this proof started, we need to know what the area of a parallelogram is. They might know it. The area of a parallelogram formula from a geometry class. You just multiply the same? Close. It's base times height. <laughs> That's all it is. The area of a parallelogram is base times height. What's the area of a triangle? 
How base? Half base, base height. The area of parallelogram is just base times height. So you and I, let's go in this picture. We're going to prove this. That this is, you know, actually true. Let's build a height right here. Just drop an altitude and make it 90 degrees. This is fun. This is a quick proof. There's my H. And I'm going to start out and write area of parallelogram equals B times H. But isn't B a vector? Mm -hmm. So and I'm going to put a magnitude on that B and put that arrow. So that means length of vector, right? Just so I'm talking about, oh, the, the actual length of that vector. Remember when we put them, those bars on there? I'm talking about its magnitude to length, All right? So length of this vector times the H. H is just some height. I don't have to, I'm not making that a vector. That's just some height. All right, now, let's put an angle in here. How about right there? The angle between the two vectors. What can I substitute for H? Well, everyone, isn't this true? I'm doing some trigonometry here. What's sine. the sine of theta? Sine theta equals to H. I'm going to write this up here. Sine of theta equals H, H over. over the magnitude of the A vector. Yep. Opposite of our hypotenuse, 7 degree. Or so cotto of the cell. Isn't that true? So what can I substitute for that H? Sine A. Sine oh, good. theta A. She goes, you could solve for H, multiply this on this side, and I can take this and what, everyone? Substitute, whoop, right there. And I think we've done the proof. <laughs> What's the area of the parallelogram? Uh, Keep that magnitude of B. What replaces this H? A magnitude of A. And the sine of theta. Sine of theta. Isn't that cool? That was a quick proof. It will always be equivalent to the area of the parallelogram. Good. They might need me to hit those shades. Is it coming up all right? Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I always worry about the, you know, the, the sun coming up and all that. The yeah, sun right. is helpful. Oh, good. <laughs> so that's the area of the parallelogram. Hey, so let's make a formula for area of a triangle. You said it's half base height, right? What's the area of any triangle that would be occupied by this? Well, I'll just take that answer and divide by what? Half. Because you'll see that everyone on the problem set. You're going to see that on the, the textbook questions. They'll go, I think more often than not, they don't actually air the parallelogram. They actually air the triangle. So you just take your answer. After you've crossed the vectors, get the magnitude, you divide by 2. Magnitude means the length of that vector, right? What would be the area of a triangle? I do have one problem in the problem set, though, that actually gets the area of the parallelogram. Um, I'm going to erase this. Now, there are application problems. We'll get to that in a second. I'll write them on the board. But I want it deals with torque. But before we get there, let's do some problems that deal with this. Okay? I mean, I'm looking at the problem set. Lots of problems in here that deal with this stuff. So, um, I see one. This is the first one. I'm just going to make, what I'm going to do is these are problems taken from the textbook, problems in the problem set, just kind of mix them up a little bit. I see one about cross products. Well, let's find this. I cross J cross K. And that looks confusing. We're going to find this answer. <laughs> find I cross, let me get in here. I cross J cross K. This always throws off students, everyone, because it's written in standard basis form. You've noticed all along, I prefer to write my vectors like this, don't I? Mm -hmm. In component form. What confuses students all the time when they read this, they go, I don't know what to do. It's because it's written in that standard basis form. So let's start out, like that, that I, what, what is I in component form? X. And make it three-dimensional. What's that value right there? X, right? There's a number in front of the I. They just don't one. write it. One. There's an invisible one. That's what throws us off. You're like, oh, there's a one there. So the vector I is one, and what are these? One. They're zero. Yep. Like, let's draw it. Everyone. Let's just, let's draw a picture so we can visualize vector I throughout this whole course. This is the x-axis. That's the y-axis. That's the z-axis. Now you can throw a vector anywhere, but let's say I threw it from the origin. Which way would it go? Because it's got to have a length of what? One. It has a length of one. 
and would go right down the positive x-axis with. I'll just draw right here. There's vector i. Let's go down his x and stop. There's i. It's got a length of 1. I mean, just so you can visualize. I didn't have to draw it from the origin. I could have drew it anywhere in that, you know. But it would go in the direction of the positive x-axis have a length of 1. Where's vector j if you want to draw it? What's j? 0, 1, 1. 0, 1, and zero. Good. All right, very good. Now, if you want to draw a picture, where's vector J? Why, oh, you're right. Yeah, I can go right there. There's J. How long is it? One. So aren't these unit vectors? Remember the word unit vector? They're uh -huh. unit vectors, yeah. So now you follow me. You go, that can be confusing, but once you see this, it's fine. Where's vector K? Zero. And what would vector K be? Zero, zero, one. Zero, zero, one. Oh, you wouldn't believe how many times that's got the students. Like they turn in a final exam. I did well, but that I cross J cross K, I didn't know what to do there. And you're like, what? I was like, I thought that was it. Once they see this, they're like, are you kidding me? I can do that. So, hey, so let's find it. So you, oh, you heard. You sure? All right, well, let's go to it. And when we're done, I'm going to see if people in class can see, is there a fast way to find this answer? Right, let's do I cross J. So what would be I cross J? Well, that would be, I'll make my matrix. What was vector i? One, zero, zero. J was 0, 1, 0. That one, if you want to put the i, j, k, you can. What is i cross j? We've got to start there, right? This should go fast because there's zeros and ones. Wipe that out. 0 minus 0 is? Zero. Boom. Do the second component, but don't forget to change the sign. One times zero minus zero times zero, change the sign. Zero. Is that what I'm doing this? I'm just doing AD minus BC. Negative zero is zero. <laughs> and how about the last component? One. See, I'm wiping out the third column. One, one times two. one minus zero times zero. One. This is I cross J. So to finish out this problem, you and I got to take this vector, 0, 0, 1, that's i cross j, and cross it with, let me write this over, what is k again? Now you should get a funny answer when you cross the same vector. We're going to discover it. What happens when you cross a vector by itself? You get a very, very interesting answer. We're going to discover it. Some of you probably are have an idea what the heck's going to happen to them when we now cross these two. What happens when you take a vector and you're crossing the same vector because that's vector k and that was vector i cross j? You get the zero vector. We'll get the zero vector. You really, there's a name for it? The zero vector. Where all three components are what? Zero. Because look, zero minus zero. Zero minus zero, change the sign, zero. <laughs> zero minus zero. Is that always going to happen when you have identical vectors and you cross them? So what's the answer to this? You can write it like this, or if you want, everyone, if you want to put the answer zero, just make sure it's a vector. You go like that. That's the zero vector. Zero. The book puts it in bold page print. I put a zero on it. Now, that was fun, but uh, I bet you there's a faster way to do this. There's something called the right-hand rule. Remember I was doing the cross product of two vectors is always what? Perpendicular vector. And we got that? I'll hold this up. All right, so you don't have to slant it. Here's my plane, here's the vector there, and here's the vector there, and they're sitting in the plane. But the cross product's what? Always perpendicular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but which way is it going? Is it going this way or is it going underneath? Well, there's something called the right hand rule to help you determine the direction of the cross product. And you go, let's do it. So what I'm going to do with this I cross J. So we did I cross J. You got to use your right hand. It's the right hand rule. All right, get the tips of your fingers on vector i. Okay, I got you. There's vector i. Want to see that i coming out? And I need you to curl towards vector j. So it'd be like this. So watch me do this. All right, here's vector i, and I'm going to curl towards j. So don't see that? I curl towards j. Whatever way my thumb's pointing is pointing in the direction of the cross product. So let's see this. So I'm starting with getting the tips of my fingers on vector i, and I'm curling towards what? Curling towards j. Which way is my thumb going? Up. 
So I cross J is going up. It's going up. But see, you might have dotted that. You might have been like, you might have had a fast way to do this. You might have been like, I cross J, I should just get K. And then K cross K, because they're the same vectors, gives you what? So there is a quicker way to do that math problem that we see then. But see, it's better to do that first, do all the math. Now we can discover that. I cross J should just be K, right? And then K cross K is zero. Now I do want to give you a heads up. In the problem set, I have an I cross J cross J. I don't think that answer is zero. So, but you can do all the math. You can do it any way you want. You can, if you want to use geometry, you can. That's a geometrical approach. But if you want to use the right hand rule to figure out the answer, you probably can figure it out. You know? Like, all right, I cross J is what? I cross J is K. Hey, I'll draw another picture. Let's say I get a vector here, and I get a vector over here. And um, this is vector A. This is vector B. I got them right there. If I did A cross B, could you tell me something? Would the vector be coming out of this green board or into the wall? Man, you're quick. <laughs> He's quick with the right hand rule. That was good. So like this way, yeah. Yep, so I gotta start with A with my what? Right Tips hand. of my fingers. And I gotta curl towards what? B. B. Okay, so it's and coming, which way is my thumb pointing? Coming towards me. Yeah. It's just weird. This would come out of the board, right? And what I'm gonna write out. Then what would B cross A be? It has to go in the opposite direction, yep. so it's going where? B. But it's weird when you try that, because when I'm trying to get my right hand, you're like, all right, how do I do that? So look, see this? See what I'm doing? B cross A. Does anyone see my thumb? Uh -huh. B cross A, look at my thumb. It's going into the board. That's called the right hand roll. All right. Well, good job with that. I wanted to do one like this. I want an area parallelogram. Let's see. Um, well, we better make sure I got some plotted here. That's one, two. That's two, five. One, two, three, four, five, right there. I just want to do an error parallel over one. One, two, comma, two, comma, five. All right. Now I got a pop point over here. Uh, this is four, comma, three. And to make that a parallelogram, what would my fourth point have to be? Let's see. This. So the next one would have to be at five comma what? Five comma six. So I'm gonna plot five comma six. Now there's other ways to get area of parallelograms to geometry. Area of a parallelogram is base time site, but can we do this with vectors? Now that we know about vectors, the area of a parallelogram has to be the magnitude of the what? The cross product of two vectors. Well, can you help me make vectors out of these? I've got one, two, four, three, two, five, five, six. These aren't vectors, but these are points, right? Let's make a vector right here. And let's make a vector right there. Does that sound cool? We'll call this vector f. But how? I did this problem on purpose. Keep, keep minus tail, right? There you go. It's like, how do we make vectors from points? I've only done it once. I did it in the last class. I gotta do it again. You said tip minus tail, right? Yeah. So what would vector A be? Two minus one. Two minus one is one. And the other one is five minus two. Three. Now everyone, because I'm going to do a cross product, I know I'm going to do a cross product, because I want to get the cross product, find the area of this parallelogram. I would like to make a third component. So what would be this K component or Zero. the Z component? Zero. 
Now what's vector big? That's 5 minus 4, that's 1. 5 minus 4 is 1, right? Oh, wait, so we got to get this point, right? 4 minus the 1, right? We're doing this one? Oh, yeah. Tip minus tail, right? Not that vector. Very good. 4 minus 1 is 3. Cool. And 3 minus 2 is 1 and 0. Let's cross them, get the magnitude we've got the area. We'll cross the vectors, then we'll take the magnitude, we'll find the area. All right, well then what is A cross B? All right, I'm going to have to do what to this thing? <laughs> That's all you do. If you want to write this, you can. They call this the determinant. We're finding the determinant of that matrix. What about the first column? 3 times 0 minus 0 times 1. 0. Now, when I get a 0 there, this is weird. You might be like, what am I going to get an area of 0? Impossible. We can see it has some area. Let's just keep going. How about the middle component? Middle component, 1 times, one times zero, 0, 0. Minus 0 times 3, 0. Change the sign. Negative 0, 0. Negative 0, 0. Well, this then has to have a number. Do you agree? Yep. It's got area. We can see it. <laughs> it's not an area of 0. All right, yeah. Sure enough, now we got it. 1 times 1? One. Minus, minus 3 nine. times 3. Negative. 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 Area negative? No, the key is we're going to get the magnitude of that vector. That's going to give us the actual area of the parallelogram. So the area of the parallelogram will be whatever the magnitude, so I'll put the bars, of that vector, 0, 0, negative 8. Unless you want to write it like this, everyone. Magnitude of vector negative 8k, if you like to put it in standard basic form. I'll leave it like that. Um, how do we do magnitude? Square root of? 64. 0 squared plus 0 squared plus a negative 8 squared. I love you doing it in your head. What's the square root of 64? 8. Oh, it's an 8. What's the area of the parallelogram? 8. But don't you need the sign thing on the area of the parallelogram too? I love it. It was like he, he knew that you could do this. You could have done some geometry. See, there's other ways to do the problem. Uh -huh. You could have gone in here and found that angle. Do you agree? You go, how can I find that angle? You could have done trigonometry. Okay. But I thought, hey, we just had to get the what? Magnitude of the cross product. So there's other ways to do that problem. Okay. In fact, you might be like, I can figure out that base right there. And I can just do base times height. Absolutely. But then I just wanted you to see this connection. So there is another way to do the problem. You go, if I can determine that angle. And you go, well, how can I determine that angle? Uh, you might go back and do this math. You can find that angle that way, right? Yeah. But you'd still deal with vectors. That's why I thought, hey, if we can get the vectors and just cross them, we just need the magnitude, Joe. In case you were to find the angle, how would you have done that? Uh, there's a few ways. Because you see in this math, you got this slanted line right here uh -huh. going to 2, 5, and this slanted line. So you draw up like a H virtual. I love it, Art, and I love what you're thinking. When he's trying to determine this angle, and he's using geometry. But this is the beauty of vectors now. The beauty of vectors, man, it just opens up a whole new world of mathematics, makes it easier to determine what? Angles, through these two formulas. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is this is the way to go. You go, I'll create vectors from points. All you have to do is create vectors from points, and you can get a what? You can get an angle that way, right? But I think you would have found yourself, you would have done that, but you still would have had to get these vectors, wouldn't you? Uh -huh. So you could have, we, we were able to avoid getting that angle. Yeah, exactly. But do you agree? You could now figure that angle out right now by either one of those formulas. Uh -huh. yeah. If anybody wants to know that angle right there, you absolutely could find it out right now. Because we know this, we know that, and we know that. Don't yeah, we? Okay, got that, yeah. The sine inverse. Okay. That's right. Okay. Be inverse sine of that. Did anybody want to find the angle? I don't either. <laughs> but you could. It would be quick. Be quick math. Really, like, yeah. So the cross they didn't product, ask us to do it. So the cross product divided by the magnitude. That's right. Okay. The cross product divided by the magnitude. Other two would be the magnitude of those two vectors. Okay. But, excuse me. The magnitude of the cross product is equal to this right here, but it's also equal to the area of the parallel. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it would have been the area of the triangle right here. Oh, here's a triangle. Look. Yeah. What's the area of that triangle? Divided by two. Let's say divide two. Area is four. That area is four. Cool. Awesome. Hey, what else we got in here? Textbook stuff, just before we get into 12.5 uh, stuff. Um, area triangle. 
Well, area triangle, we know we could do that. It's going to be very similar. The only thing is I want to give you points. You know how to get vectors? Vectors from points? Tip minus tail. A couple more things from this section before we get into 12.5. I have another theorem. And I need to put it right underneath of this. Torque. Torque is defined as these the Greek letter tau for torque, everyone. Tau. The position vector cross the force vector. Force equals to work into distance, right? That's right. But that's torque. It's the cross product of a position vector and a force vector. Okay, and then what's the magnitude of torque? I mean, what would be the magnitude of the torque? I'll put it right above this. Well, if that's the definition of, a, of the torque, it's the cross product of the position vector and the force vector, then what would be the magnitude of torque? It would have to equal what? The magnitude of the position, position vector times the magnitude of the force. force times the sine of the angle between the position vector and the force vector. So in this case, I might as well take a problem. I didn't have to, uh, have to memorize all these formulas, so I'm going to give them on the sheet. You can either memorize them, because uh -huh. sometimes memorization is more how things got developed. You can either memorize them, or if you want, everyone knows PID 3s and 84s, you can store them in the program button. And if you're like, can you show me how to do that? Go oh, after class. It'll probably take less than two minutes. Should I do one? You can do a million. <laughs> Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Awesome. If you do, if you have questions about that, I'd be glad to show you how to do that. Hey, let's do a problem. I'm, I'm taking this actually as an example. It's on page 9, no, 838 in your book. Just an example of the book. I can make up different numbers, but I won't. And they got a wrench. They've got a wrench like this. I'll make that little wrench thing. There's a little bolt right here. All right, there's the wrench, there's the bolt. So how long is this? They said that's 0.25 meters long. That's how long that wrench is. All right, there's the wrench. Uh, they stuck a force vector this way. 40 newtons. Anything else? Thank you, they gave us the angle. I mean, this is just going to be a plug and chug problem. <coughs> They've given us everything. And that's the angle. I do want to point out, everyone, yeah, we're going to find the magnitude of the torque. If you're wondering, is there one like this on the, on the practice set? Same thing. Find the magnitude of the torque about the center of the bolt. And that's what we're going to do. Find the magnitude of the torque about the center of the bolt. All right. No problem. But gosh, we've got the angle. We've got the position vector. We've got the force vector. This is going to be rather simple. This is just going to be a plug and joke. I do want to point out, sometimes students are curious about, like, where is that position vector? I see the wrench right there, everyone. If you're curious, this wrench, the position vector, is actually the vector that would start here and go up this way. That's really the position vector. If anyone want to make a note, when you're talking about, but the wrench is going this way, that's the actual position vector. And can I slide that here? Yep. So the angle between these vectors, you don't have to do, like, 180 minus 75 or anything. I didn't want you to think you got to overthink the problem. The theta we're going to use in this math form is going to be the what? The 75 degrees. Oh, so the position is also in the same direction. So you That's have to right. Change the sign. Okay. That's exactly it. So I don't want you to be confused. Think like, do I have to do more with the problem like this? Nope. I am just going to do magnitude of position vector, magnitude of the force vector, and multiply the sine of that angle. And this was what? Just 0.25 meters? The force was 40 newtons. And a sine of 75, we need a calculator. And I'll let you all type it in, and we'll just put a rough answer down. Or I'll just steal the book and see what they wrote.
9.66. That's what they got. About 9.66. Newton meters. Newton meters. Nine point six six newton meters. Hey, one more thing before we do 12.5. Um, Maggie, thanks again for bringing this up. Now, when there's a problem in 12.3, it's a neat problem. Somebody might have tried it already and gone, I don't know about this one. It's going to be rather easy now that we've done 12.4. And it says, we won't work it out, but I want us to talk about it. The question is, can you find a unit vector that's orthogonal to I plus J? That's a vector, right, everyone? Mm -hmm. If you put it in component form, what are the numbers? One. One, one, zero, right, everyone? And then this vector, j plus k. It's already solved this. I'll just make the torque get out of the way. But there's a question like this earlier, and you might have been like, you might, you might have set up an algebra problem to solve it. But I think right now with cross product, this is going to be rather easy. Can we just cross these? Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do. Now they said the word unit though. So when you're done crossing them, do you remember how to make a unit vector? It's divided by the magnitude. Right. No, that was loud too. You know exactly what to do. Hey, if they try to get tricky here, they said, find two unit vectors. Get your one answer, and what could you do to all the sides? Make, a negative. Make them all negative. Switch all the sides. It's just going to stick the vector into what? The opposite direction. So when they play games like that, like find two, that's what they want you to be thinking of. Just go, I'm just going to go to my answer where the vector's like this, and I'll just put it in the opposite direction. It'll still be orthogonal to the two vectors in that plane, right? What do you think of like this desk? It's like, oh, it either goes up, mm -hmm. perpendicular, or it's what? Going it's down. underneath the plane going down. So they do a two thing. Oh. Sometimes they do that. You're going to see, they're going, find two, and you're thinking, gosh, I got one, how do I get the other? That's all you got to do. You know, A cross B versus B cross A. And uh, anything else before we get into 12 5? 12 5 is fun, it's lines and planes. That's the title. There's one more thing. Has anybody looked over the problem set yet? I think I saw some. Oh, awesome. People are already looking at it, or maybe did the textbook problems. You're going to notice this. There's a lot of questions about things like this. Where you got to determine. I'm going to give you an example. Oops. They're thinking problems. This is my first example. And that's a dot for dot product. That's a cross for cross product. That's a cross for cross product. And they just ask questions like this. Determine whether or not, first of all, it's defined, let's let A, B, C, and D be vectors. Okay? Mm -hmm. So ask this question. This right here, is it a vector? Is the solution a scalar? Or is it just totally, totally meaningless? <laughs> so it's one of these three options. They're either going to give you something that means something like, oh, that's a vector. Has meaning. That's just a scalar value. Well, any scalar value has meaning. Or they're, make, they're writing something down that's totally what? Meaningless. I got a couple. I think I have two or three of these in the practice set. The problem set. I should call it a problem set. There's some of these in the textbook. Well, let's do a few of these together. I'll make them up. And uh, we have to do a bunch, but enough to get us thinking. So first of all, if you ever see a dot, what has to be on either side of a dot? I want to point that out. I mean, so here's the first rule. If you ever see that dot for dot product, then the opposite side of each has to be a dot. That's the first rule. If you see a cross, what has to be on the other side of the cross? Vectors. So let's just start there. So someone puts a dot down and sticks like a magnitude on the <coughs> one side of the dot, go, wait, that has no meaning. Right? You're either dotting two vectors or you're crossing two vectors, right? Now. When you cross two vectors, there has to be a vector here, do you agree? Mm -hmm. There has to be a vector here. When you dot two vectors, what's the result? Scalar. What happens when you cross two vectors? Vector. I love it. And that's probably what we just need to know when we do the problem. 
So we're running, all right, everything looks good. There's a dot, vector and a vector. There's a cross, there's a vector and a vector. Looking good so far. So let's start here. What is all this? Scalar. So I'm going to put an S for scale. So it looks like I got a scalar cross a, what's a vector cross a vector? Vector. Can we do that in math? So what is this? Is this right here? Everything I wrote, is this a vector, a scale, or a meaningless? Meaningless. This is meaningless. I'm going to put M for meaningless. This is totally meaningless. You can't cross a scalar with a vector. Do you follow me? So these are the questions they ask. Um, but you can multiply a scalar by a vector. That's right. You just can't confuse the symbol. And I like to do an example, everyone. Did you hear what he just said? Here's a vector. He goes, you can multiply a scalar to a vector, just a vector. You know, I'm not talking about cross products or dot products. He goes, you're allowed in math to multiply a scalar to a vector. I want to give an example. That's a vector, right? But it's not a unit vector. How could we get a unit vector? Divided by two. And that's what you're doing. You're dividing out the magnitude. You're multiplying some number to the vector. What's the magnitude? One square root five. Yeah, there you go. So you see what I'm doing? I'm multiplying this to this. You're allowed, we're allowed to do that. You can multiply scalars to vectors, right? So you can multiply a scalar to a vector. I'll tell you what you can't do, though. You can't take a scalar and divide a vector. Just to, yeah, that's another weird one. Can you take like a scalar value like 5 and then divide out like a vector like this? No. There's no like divide vectors. Vector, this has no meaning. Look. Just go like this. You can't do that. But you can do what? Divide a vector. Yeah, you can take a vector and divide out a what? A buy from all three of the numbers. You follow me? Yeah, that's okay. Th that's what we did. You need vector. There you go. He goes right there. There's a good example. So let me let me make another one up. Uh, I'll steal one from the book. Um, Can you divide a vector by another vector? No. Good question. She goes. Can you divide a vector by a vector? Like, I'm gonna take vector f. Divide out vector b. So make a point. Your ne what's never going in that denominator? Vectors. Maggie will never ever do vectors in a denominator. <laughs> but you can divide the magnitude of both the vectors. Right? That's right. He, he, magnitude, he's mentioning scaling. Yes. I'm looking for one, everyone. I want to find the one that could trick you. I don't want to trick you. Which one? Um, you could, everyone, 12.3, number one is good practice in the book. Those answers in the back of the book. 12.4, number 13, I'm so happy on because they're odd problems, so the answers are where? Back your book. So when you're doing the ones on the practice set, you're unsure. Like if you're confident, you probably won't have to check these. But if you're unsure, go check some of these. I'm trying to find, I don't think I can stump you, but I'm going to try to. Um, okay. I just don't think I can get it. How about this? Vector, scalar, or meaningless. Some of you are probably pretty fast too. B and C are That's vector a dot too. I, I should be. I want to make sure when I make that dot, I want to make it big so you know it's a dot. The B and C are vectors. So that's a vector. That's a vector. Vector dot vector is a scalar. That had meaning. That would have meaning, right? I'm trying to think of another one too. How about magnitude of vector a? Times, so when I put magnitude on it, and then here I got a vector b cross a vector c. Now hopefully you'll find this also has some meaning. That's a vector. Because very good. That's a what? Vector. That's a vector. But what am I multiplying to the vector? Scalar. Some scalar. scalar number, like an example like this. And if you multiply a scalar value, just not a dot product, just a scalar multiplied to a vector, then the overriding answer should be a what? Vector. You got it. Change the magnitude. You got it. And if you have any doubt, just check the book for some of these for practice. Because I did put a few of those in there, didn't I? They, they make you think. I like that. That's good. All right, your notes put 12 out. Look at them all. I'm looking through here. There's nothing else weird. Cross products, dot products. So cool. We find area triangles. I love when you all are talking about those angles, or you brought up the point about angles, Art. I mean, this opens a whole new part of mathematics, but it makes it easy to determine angles. Before, it was all about what? Oh, should I do the law of cosines or the law of sine? Should I get my right triangle? Man, now it's easy, and you got two options. 
Sometimes you might go, which one should I use? I, I'll tell everyone if I have to find an angle, the book problem is to find an angle. I always use this one. Just me personally. I think dot products are easier than cross products. So I just want to let you know that. When they ask me to find an angle, if I'm going to measure the angle between these vectors, I always go for that theorem. It's faster. It's faster. I just find it faster to do a dot product than a cross product. Maybe a minute faster, but faster, right? Mm -hmm. All right. This is lines and planes. We're going to start with lines. And they call them the parametric equations of a line. Is this 12.5? This is 12.5. I don't care if I erase all that. Yeah, we won't need that. <coughs> I mean, cross product. <coughs> cross product will come up in our in our discussion. You bet. That stuff's gonna be useful here. The parametric equation of a line. Um, wait, two dimensional space. Isn't that the equation of a line? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need a point and a slope. We get it. Why equals m x plus b? It's funny in three dimensional space. It looks, it's going to look kind of goofy when we try to write it this way. It really will. Now, it's not hard. It's just we do it in a different manner. We use parametric equations. We use parametric equations, all right, to write, to describe that line going through space. You go, what, what is parametric equations? We use a parameter. You go, what's a parameter? Yeah, a parameter is just a letter. Yeah, it's just a variable. We just use another letter other than x and y and what. Z. So, popular letter they use, they like to use lowercase t. All right? That's the parameter we're going to use, t. Of course, you could have used a, I wouldn't use j or k because of the idea of ij's and k's. You know, you could have used like a what? Maybe a g or something, but we always use t. So, well, let's make up a point. Um, how about the point 1, 2, 3? And when it's on some line in space, it's the point 1, 2, 3. The key is you need to have a parallel vector. That's essential. So when I'm going to run a vector that runs parallel to the line, and I'm just going to make it up. The parallel vector, I'm just making this up, everyone, is the vector 4, 5, 6. That's my parallel vector to the line. It runs parallel to the line. That's what you need to come up with your parametric equation of line. No question about it. No, no question about it. When we always need one point. Just one point on the line, that's all. But you also need a parallel vector. A vector that is somehow parallel to the line. Okay, now, have I provided that for you in this example? All right, then here comes the parametric equation of the line. You could write this vertically, or you could write it horizontally. I think I'll be sure. Put your point down. X equals, put the 1 there, the 2 there, and the 3 there. Put a plus and a plus and a plus. I'm putting that parameter down, T. Put a T and a T and a T, and leave some space. In front of these T's, everyone, I need you to put the parallel vector. So I'm going to draw an arrow right there. Right in front of these, the coefficients to these T's must be your parallel vector. And this will be your parametric equations line. So what goes here? 4, 5, 6. There's the answer. You can put a box around it. Now, I wrote this vertically, right? Can you write it horizontally? Sure. Uh, what would it look like? My answer, x equals 1 plus the what? You can put a comma. y equals 2 plus the 5p. Put a comma. z equals 1. So when you, because th I need all of this to describe that one line. Now I know you're all like, why can't we write it like y equals mx plus b? Oh, I'll do it with you. I just don't think you're going to do it too often. So, uh, these, these you're going to leave it like this. So the parallel vector can't be, the vector can't fall on the line? It absolutely can fall on the line. I love that. Okay. Everyone, that's going to be useful in most <laughs> cases. Yeah. Everyone, it just has to be parallel. So you're like, well, could it be a vector sitting right on the line? Absolutely. But when they give you certain information, think like that. Go, if it's a vector on the line, oh, yeah, I can use that. Because that's going to be the missing part. They're going to give you, like, some scenario. Hey, find the parametric equation of the line. Your key is you've got to pick one of the points, doesn't matter which one, and then you need your parallel vector. Sound cool? 
Now, this equation is which for which one? The parallel vector or the line? This right here describes the line. Line, okay. And it, and, and it goes on infinitely. Okay. Do you all agree on the line never stops, doesn't it? Yeah. So this is now, I want to point out, you go, I have just described this line in three-dimensional space. Now, how many points do you think are on that line? I love it. She goes, infinite? I love she said that. Do you all agree? <laughs> now, I gave you one, but how many points are on this line? Infinite amount. Can we find, like, three of them real quick? Sure, let's make a little table. You want to find some more points on a line? What are some more points on a line? Well, let me put one of them. I can plug in anything for t. t is the parameter, right? It's just a variable. You get to make up any t values you want. <coughs> like, for instance, what if t equals 0? It's just a parameter. What if t is 0? What's a point on that line? 1, 2, 3. Oh, the, the point I gave you. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so, did you all see that? Mm -hmm. t equals 0 is the point that you had. But let's find some more points on this line. Just, just two more. Want to use t equals 1? What's another point on that line? So, that's 5. Yep. Five plus two, seven, seven, and nine. Can you find one more point? Hey, by the way, I'm plugging in easy integers, but could you plug in like pi? Yeah. There's an infinite amount of points, but I'll use two. <laughs> Thanks. Nine. Nine. Twelve. Twelve. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yep. Hey, could you plug in a negative value? Yep. I should show that just in case people thought you always had to use positive numbers for your parameter. Oh, no. Use negative 100. What's, what's 1 minus 4? 2 minus 15. No, wait a minute. I'm sorry. 2 minus 5. And then 3 minus 6. Oh, cool. Throw a 1. Hey, that was neat. That would be the point. These are points. <coughs> Take them on, bro. Isn't that awesome? Now. There's another way to write this. I wrote it what? Vertically. I wrote it horizontally. Isn't that your call? It really is. It's your call. Sometimes on a test, I put a blank space here. We take that test, you know, a couple weeks from now. And I go, find the parametric equation line. And I leave this long space. All the time, students just go off to the right and they go, <coughs> and put them all right here. They write it just like this. Because that's the way they're doing their homework problems. They're like, I'm not going to fill out your whole stupid space. I'm just going to put it right here. That's totally fine. You can also write this as a vector. Isn't that neat? You can describe a line. This is a parametric equation of a line. You could describe it with a vector. So I want to show you that. Can you write the vector equation of a line? I'll put it right underneath this. What would be the vector equation that represents the line? Well, then what would I have to put in all my three components? I pitch you now. Go and look, I'm making a vector. Now, we've got to call the vector something. What do you want to call it? The V. Okay, V. We'll call it vector V. We'll just to make up a letter for the vector. But this vector is going to describe this line. What's going to be the x component? Oh, so 1 plus 4t. Boom! What's two, this component? 2 plus 5t. And 3 plus 6t. And if you want it one, just, you don't have to do this. Maybe underneath this, you could likely write that this is my x component. That's why that's x, right? Likely. What's this? I just I want to write it really light so you always know, yeah, you're x. You're y. Y is equal to you. And this component is what? Sometimes students have trouble between x, y, and z in this t. You go, well, that's the x component. That's the y component. So you, can you write it like that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, I wrote v equals, um, you know in math when we wrote f of x as a function? Well, in chapter 13 next week, we do something called vector functions. So if you want. Since the parameter of the variable was t, you could also call this v of t. I'm just going to write that, if you want to do that. They don't show that notation until chapter 13. Might as well talk about it now. Can I write it as a function? Yeah, it's a vector. And what's the variable t? v of t. t is my <coughs> one variable. We did a little bit on calc 2, just to yeah, put that on. That's right. Uh, hey, as the third way, and when the third way is showing you how to write it like what? Now, it's going to look weird, so I want to give you a heads up. It's going to look kind of goofy, so maybe once, twice, you might write it like this, but you might stop. That was easy in what? Two-dimensional space. You know, one equal sign with what? And was there any parameters in there? No, were there any t's in that? Let me make up an example. And when that's two space, right? Mm -hmm. Line in two space. Y equals I make the slope is two. See, this thing will still have a slope. 
wide slope at two, wide intercept three, and all that stuff. Can we do that with this? Yes, that would mean we would have to eliminate what letter? The T. The T. But it's going to look funny. So, are you ready? They call these the symmetric equations of the line. I just don't know how much you're going to like this. I don't. 99% of the problems we're going to do are in vector form or in just that parametric form. And what would be the symmetric equations of the line? Let me just put this in quotations. This means we're going to eliminate what variable? T. The T. We're just going to get the T out of that thing. Can you do it? Oh, yeah. yeah. But it so looks fun. Like 1 plus 4y? Well, here's what we got to do. And if I'm going to eliminate the T, I'm going to use this one. I need you to solve for T. If I'm going to eliminate the T, then you know what I have to do? I'm going to solve. For t in each case and set them equal to each other. That's all I'm gonna do. Solve for t, solve for t, solve for t, and throw them all equal to each other. So x minus one divided by four. All right, let me start out. X minus one divided by four. T solve for t here. Now I need you to do it here. Uh, y minus two divided by five. Okay, but you have to do it one more time. That's why this is kind of silly. Uh, z minus three divided by six. Look what I'm writing. Z minus three divided by one. I mean, what do y'all think? Yeah. It's just, call me. This is a much better, this is much, much better to deal with parametric form. That's exactly how you'd write it, and you'd leave it like this. You'll see this, I want, if you check through the textbook, I think I had, I want to make sure I at least sign one problem where it said what? Find the symmetric equation of the line. I just want to let you know that on my test, you don't have to provide the answer in the symmetric formation. Unless you really like it. <laughs> Then you're going to make me do all my math and go, is that right? That's too much work. <laughs> yeah. Plus it looks funny, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I don't, this is not very convenient for doing math integrals. We're going to still do calculus in this you know, Integrals, derivatives, it's just not, it's not very convenient. We're here. Everyone, can you differentiate <laughs> that with respect to, respect to t? Yep. Just four. <laughs> right? I'm serious. You go, oh, then. But it is a way to eliminate the t. So not funny? So maybe they should teach it like this way in algebra one class, right? Let's just get students used to this. I don't know. That'd be, you know, up, to, up for an argument. People go, nah, you don't need the T yet. All right, great job with that. So let me throw a problem at you and see if you can do this. Um, hey, Maggie, we just pick a point in space. Anything. Make one at least negative. <laughs> Five, negative, two, eight. All right, everyone, here's a point. There's a point in space. I'm picking the next point. Um, it's 7, 1, 12. Another point in space. I need you to find the parametric equations of that line. That's what I need. We say to ourselves, wait, what do we need? We need a point and we need a parallel vector. So, so well, we got two points. Does it matter which point we use? No, I'm going to use magnets. <laughs> Doesn't matter, though, do you agree? We just need one point. I'll use that one. But I want a picture because I'm blank. I didn't give myself the parallel vector. So I'm just going to draw a picture. Drawing pictures makes me think better. Maybe drawing a picture helps me think. 5, 9, 2, 8. What was another point on the line? But I'm stumped on one because I know to get my answer, I do have to provide a parallel vector. Any suggestions? Watch this. What vector can I use? It's got to be a vector that's parallel. Tip minus two. He says use that vector right there. Just make it. Wouldn't the vector right on this line? Mm -hmm. Tip minus tail be a vector that's parallel line? You got it. That's exactly what we're going to do. So when, let's find this parallel vector of the tip minus the tail. What would be a vector that's running parallel to that line? Parallel two, vector. Oh, you bet. Two, it's on the line. Three, four. And I can slide it anywhere off the line, but it would stay parallel to the line. 7 minus 5 is what? 1 minus negative 2. 12 minus 8. Why well, I didn't do that on purpose, by the way. That was cool. <laughs> so my answer, I want to do this for x equals y equals z equals. I'm going to use Maggie's point. 5, negative 2, 8. And a plus and a plus and a plus. And a t and a t and a t. What goes in front of these t's? 2, 3, 4. Right there. The coefficients to the t's is your parallel vector. The 2, the 3. <laughs> Actually, if you want, there's multiple ways to write this answer. You could use any scalar multiple of this because any scalar multiple of a, of a vector is going to be parallel to that vector. 
you know? If you're just trying to be silly with me, and multiply a million to all these, just and then put it, right? The proportional relationship. That's right. He says the proportional relationship. Cool. Awesome. I'll tell you what, with, to stay organized, every time you see this problem, I think it is helpful. Use the initial point given, then do this minus this to get your what? Vector. And that will run smoothly when we do chapter 16, the last chapter of this textbook that we, that we cover. We do something called a line integral. And you've got to set up your integral, but you'll notice something. It'll be, if you do it that way, these will be your t values. That parameter t. You go from t equals 0 to t equals 1. Because you'll notice, when you plug in 0, what point do you get? You get Maggie's point. Guess what happens when you plug in a 1? You will always get what? Check it out. Plug in the 1. You'll always get that next point that's sitting there. Do you follow me? I just think it's a good way to stay organized. It's like, oh yeah, it's like a nice little line segment. <laughs> zero to one. Cool. All right, hey, we'll come back to lines in a second. We've got to talk about planes now. No, there's no parametric equations of a plane, but there's an equation of a plane. Now this is neat, Owen, because this is a surface. An equation of a plane. How do we describe an equation of a plane? Now when I make a note, that's a surface, isn't it? versus a line, like this tabletop. All right, how do we do this? What's going to be essential is the dot product of two perpendicular vectors. That's how we're going to form it every time. What's the dot product of two perpendicular vectors? Zero. 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 That's how we always form an equation of a line, if you can remember that. We're going to think of the dot product of two vectors. So, I'm going to just draw a picture. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to put this here. Is that plane big enough? I'm just trying to slant it, right? And let's put a vector right here. 90 degrees to the what? Plane. To the plane? Five, two, or excuse me. How about five, seven, eight is the normal vector. Five, seven, eight. <coughs> Perpendicular to a point. I'm going to pick a point and put it in the plane. Here's the point. The point is one, two, three, like before. Just an easy point. And you and I are going to find the equation of this plane. Equation of what? Which one? We're going to find the equation of the plane that plane. occupies that space, excuse me, that, that point, one, two, three. One, two, three is in the plane. And a vector that's running perpendicular or orthogonal or <coughs> normal. I can call this a normal vector to the plane now. It's a normal vector to the plane. Here, I'll say u equal n. <laughs> You're the normal vector to the plane. <laughs> Worry have enough information right now to find the equation of plane. So this is critical. we got to know this. In order to get an equation of plane, this is what we're going to need. We're going to need at least one point on the plane. We're going to need that. But then we also need a vector that is perpendicular, that is perpendicular or orthogonal or normal to plane. We're going <coughs> to the equation of the plane. The vector doesn't have to like, cut through the plane, right? That's right. It could be anywhere, because can't we slide vectors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's I drew it there, and she goes, they could have been over here. But the idea is you can always slide vectors anywhere. They just got to keep the same size and direction. That's the idea. I know I put it right on that plane like that. So very good. Now, here's what we do every time. The other point. We're just going to call it x, y, z. And everyone, what's the dot product of two perpendicular vectors? Zero. Zero. That's how we're going to form every equation of a plane. So here's the math formula for an equation of plane. I'm going to do the dot product of this vector and this vector. We go, well, hold, hold up. How do I make a vector out of this? How do I make a vector out of this? Tip minus tail. Tip minus tail. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to think of one vector as 5, 7, 8. What's my other vector? x minus a what? 1. y minus a 2. And z minus a 3. And here's the equation of plane. Ready? Dot product. 5 times the 
x minus the 2. Plus, and this is how we do dot products, 7 times the y minus the 2. Should be x minus 1. Oh, you're the best. 5 times the x minus the 1. Plus 7 times the what would be the what would be the y component of vector in the plane? Y minus the 2, right? Make a vector out of that. And then finish out the dot product. 8 times the z minus 3. But too often than not, everyone, that's the answer I get on the test. And I'm, I'm, I'm cringing. I have to take off points from the student. Let's say the student's name is Fred. I'm like, oh Fred, oh gosh. It's an equation. Every equation has a what? Equal sign. And do you remember what we said? The dot product of two perpendicular vectors equals what? Zero. So what's here always, no matter what? Equals zero. Equals zero. Equals zero. Equals zero. There's no t's in here, are there? So I don't want you to confuse this with the line. Although we can pair the twos up and find like intersecting points, and true, we could do that. This equals zero. Why you that again? This equals zero because remember the dot product of two perpendicular vectors. Oh, it's zero. It's and zero. I think we should draw. What would be that vector right here? It would be the vector what? I'll just put it in here. It would be the x minus the what? One. We're calling this a vector <coughs> sitting in that plane. And the dot product of this vector with that vector has to equal what? Zero. Because oh. it's in the plane. Does that agree? That's how we always form it. Now, can you leave answers like this? Absolutely. I have a feeling there when in my practice. The practice set sometimes, I don't know if it's in there, but sometimes they simplify this, so let's do that. What would be if I distribute everything? 5x minus 5. Five. Five. Alright, um, you might find this easier to deal with. It takes a little extra math, but you might want to, I just want to do this. What's all that equal to? See, this isn't probably going to be a zero now. So I got the 5x, the 7y, and the 8z. Now what am I going to do with all that? Oh, good. Add them all together, uh -huh. and I'll put it over here. So do you agree now this isn't going to be a 0 anymore, probably? Yeah. Because negative 5 minus 14 is what? Negative 19. Negative 19 minus 24. 43. Negative 43. So. Negative 43. And then if I add it to the right side, what's sitting here? 43. So I don't want to write it like this. But I think this is helpful because most planes are written like this. So you can recognize it. I mean, are there any x squareds? Are there any y squareds? No. Any e to the e to the z's? Natural logs of x's? No. No x cubes, x squareds. We're gonna get that. To, we're gonna get to that in a second. There you go. What if there's x squareds in the surface equation? Oh, then you get stuff like. Did you see me? Just like this. <laughs> you can get like parab you know, things that do like parabolas, but in three dimensional space, it's gonna be like parabolic. Everything. This is just a flat plane, right? This doesn't have to be a zero once you get it all once. Simplify. Does that make sense? But originally, if you do it this way every time, what's going to be here every time, Mark? Zero. Right. Does that make sense? It's always going to be equal zero. That's the part. Sometimes I see what on the test. Do you have any right now? You know, they just they forgot to write the what. It's like this is not an equation. It's got to be equal to a zero. Um, can I check if I did this right? What happens if I put that 1, 2, 3 back in here? This should be a 1. True statement? Yeah. Everyone agree? I want to make sure I did this problem right. That means this point has to be on this what? That plane. So if I plug it back into that equation, it's got to be mathematically true. It's a good idea to check things like that. Now, do you want to find more points on that plane? Sure, you just have to make up two numbers and see what the third number is. You know what I mean? Like, everyone, there's a point on this plane. <laughs> x is equal to 100, y is equal to a million, but the value of z, I'd have to do all this math to figure out the value of what? Z. z. There's an infinite amount of points on that plane, but we only needed one, right? And what else do you need? You always need what kind of vector? That's it. So and this is the picture just to keep in your notes to say, boy, if I need a plane, what do I need? I need that thing and I need a what? That's what I need. If I don't have it, I'm gonna to have to find it. In, so in two dimensional, the perpendicular line, the product of the perpendicular line is negative one. In three D in vectors, the dot product is zero. There you go. There you go. That was very good. And when he was going back, to remember algebra class? We said, hey, uh, <coughs> the uh, the two vectors, uh, not vectors. But we'll go back to a slope of a line was two thirds. Well, the line perpendicular had a slope of what? 
negative, negative three halves. Mm -hmm. And he goes, now we're dealing with vectors. The dot product of two perpendicular vectors will always equal one. Zero. Zero and a half. How come? Let me write this again. There's the dot product. Doesn't it equal this? Yeah. What would be the angle if it was uh, 90 degrees? Zero. I mean, who <laughs> would? That's silly. I go, what would be the angle? If it's cosine of 90 degrees, a cosine of 90 is what? Zero. Zero. It just helps us remember that. Good. All right, let's do a tough one. And when I need the equation of a blank. some invisible plane. Do you all agree? Mm -hmm. Three points determine a plane. There's some plane in space and they all sit on the plane. My question is, I need you to find the equation of that plane. These are just three points. They're sitting on the plane and you and I are going to find the equation of the plane. Alright, what do we need to find the equation of a plane? Let me get the this parallel one. line? No. Oh, wait, that was for lines, right? Yep. For a plane, what do we need? You got it. So I'm going to put a plane, I'll go like this, I'll go like this. I'm telling you, it's all about pictures. This is what we need, don't we? Oh, it looks like I need a point. How many points do I have to choose from? Doesn't matter which point I use, right? Do you all agree? Hey, going back to lines though, Art, you said some, what about lines? We don't have to do a line this problem. What do we always need? With a line, you needed some vector that ran what? Parallel. Parallel. So when I know it was lines before, you always need a point with a parallel. With a plane, you need what kind of vector? Perpendicular vector. A normal vector. Orthogonal vector. Okay. So we create a vector between two of the points? And then That's where we're starting. That was brilliant. I'm going to get this thing going. He says, why don't we create vectors? I love this. So uh, can we make up letters? Are you okay if I call you P and you Q and that means you're R? Does that work? Mm -hmm. So he says, to start with, you're going to have to create vectors from points. That's the first step. So. Uh, we're going to need how many vectors probably? Two. Two of them? Maggie, very good. So, everyone sound okay if we get PQ? Mm -hmm. I'm serious. You might be like, can I get RP? Of course. You just need, we got to get started. We got to get some vectors out of this thing. These will be vectors in the plane. So, everyone, let me make a note. These vectors we're finding, they're sitting in the plane. Because the points are in the one plane. So, here's vector PQ. Tip minus tail, right? Mm hmm. One. Crap, here come the negatives. I want <laughs> negative ten. Then the one. Thanks for the negative. No, that's good. We, we like to do with the negative. Negative ten, subtract negative eleven. One. one. Five minus four. One. All right. All right, what's PR? Just to get another record. Three. Three. Negative twelve. Negative Yikes. one. Negative 12 subtract negative 11. That means negative 12 plus 11 stays negative as well. Is that right? Yes. Don't agree? Yep. And then <coughs> 7 minus 4. 3. But this, I'm still lost. You're going to have to help me out. Sometimes I draw a picture to get me going. Now, and here's my slanted one. Plane. I got all these vectors in. You know, and we just found how many vectors? But look where they're sitting. You can make errors. These vectors we found are sitting in the what? They're in the plane. And I know I need what? <laughs> Any idea? I heard it. Cross product. They said just cross those two. You're going to have this thing all wrapped up. How can I get a vector that runs like that off the plane? Cross. The cross product of two vectors must be perpendicular. perpendicular. And you go, what if it goes this way? It doesn't matter. You just need a vector that's what? 
normal on a plane. So it doesn't matter if it goes this way or this way. You can do PQ cross PR, you can do PR cross PQ, you can do RQ cross RP. As long as you cross two vectors in that plane, right? So I think I'll do PQ cross PR. All right. And you're good. Wipe it out. Three minus negative one. Is that four? I don't want to rush you, Owen, because I know we're doing some mental math here. I know. But three minus negative one. That can get nasty if the numbers are like 26 times two minus eight times three. So especially on a test, you try to keep them numbers that the students going to go like this. My right, middle component, don't forget, start, you got to change the sign when you're done. 3 minus 3, change the sign. Oh, oh. 3 minus 3 is 0, <laughs> change the 0, what do you get? 0. But I do want you to remember, that's the one we always change the sign to. And lastly, negative 1 minus 3. Negative 4. Now, do you remember my suggestion of when every time I do a cross product? <clears throat> I'm, talk, I'm, I'm talking 100% of the time. I always make sure I didn't screw this up. Because my eyes are looking all over the place, um, and I might have drifted, looked at the wrong column. So I make sure that the dot product here is equal to what? Zero. zero. And the dot product with this is equal to zero. It's like just a nice insurance. I know I did the problem. There's no way I messed it up, unless I copied a number wrong. And that's true. 4 times 1, 0 times 1, negative 4 times 1 is 0. 4 times 3 plus 0 times negative 1 plus negative 4 times 3 is 0. So there it is. Now, is this my answer? I've seen that before, too. You know, you did so much mathematics, you're like, I'm done. Because you knew you needed the normal vector. And you're like, wait, I never wrote the what? Equation. How do we write this equation? We set it up as, you ready? We need this thing. That's sitting right here, right? How do we write the equation of a blank? It's always four times something mm -hmm. plus zero times something plus negative four times, and then what's it all equal to? Zero. Zero. I think it's this answer ready. What goes in the parentheses, though? See, oh, I love it. She the points. And I do x minus, y minus, and z minus. Is it always a minus? Yes, because we said with vectors you always do tip minus tail, right? Yeah. So this would be the x minus, now which point do you want to use? Let's use the first one. It doesn't matter which point you use, I want to call you if you use a p. So x minus a? 6. six. y minus a? Hey, how do you want to make that? Plus. Now when you can make that a plus 11. And then z minus a equals? And you're done. And I'm going to make that a plus, okay, everyone? You don't want us to. You don't have to. Because when the whole y factor disappears from I mean, you can totally do it if you want. Okay. And when, what's so cool about planes is these coefficients, to the x, y's, and z's, have to be the what? The normal vector. Or at least <coughs> some scale of multiple of the normal vector. Cool? It was just a nice check. Awesome. Hey, uh. We'll now do 12 6. I just want to make sure. Oh, the way, we'll be 12. there's one more problem I want to do. Um, and when this is like the last problem on this practice set, there's a problem in the, uh, the textbook like this. So I want to give it to you. Planes. Now we know how to get the equation of a plane, right? How can we tell if two planes in space are parallel or perpendicular? That's what we're going to write. So can I erase this? Mm -hmm. Now you all notice these numbers in front of the x, y's, and z's, they represent the normal vector, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's key. Well, how do you know if two planes are parallel or are they perpendicular or the other answer would be neither? Now, hey, this is like the last problem in the practice set. This is also like section 12.5. I know I signed some of these. I want them just to practice. This is like number 51, 53. So 
only make a vector plane up. Watch how I'm going to make up planes. 2x plus 5y minus z equals, this doesn't always have to equal 0, though, does it, if I got everything no. distributed? I'm going to just make that like 11. That's one plane. Now let me make up another plane. I'm making these up. Um, okay. 6x minus y plus 7. equals, how about 23? Now those are two equations of planes. Do you all agree? Can you tell them? You know, the x, the y, the z, there's numbers in front of them just like we had before. Our question is, we've got to determine whether these two planes, this one plane is another plane, are they parallel, are they perpendicular, are they neither? Well, let's start with perpendicular planes. I don't know. I can go like this. Well, then this has a normal vector going like that. And this thing has a normal vector going like that. What do you think would have to be going on with those two vectors, those normal vectors? Parallel. If the two planes are like this. I think I'll use my folders because you'll see it. And when I got a vector like this, here's a plane, and here's a plane, right? Now, if they're perpendicular, it's something like this, do you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, where's the normal vector going off that green folder? Up. Oh, Up. Oh. Where's the vector going off this sheet? This towards us. It's going out. What do you think has to be going off those two? Also, oh, there will be uh, something's going on with them. They are normal, right, to each other? Very good. What and would they, be their dot product? Zero. There it is. That's what we're going to do. To determine whether or not, I love it, man. To determine whether or not two planes are perfect <coughs> to each other, the dot product would equal what? Zero. Zero. So that would be for this. That's what we're going to check. Now, if the dot product's not equal to zero, then they're not perpendicular. How are we going to know if they're parallel? Because Parallel planes, everyone, just go like this, right? Check another better folder there. Ah, this will do. You know, you go, what's going on with these? That just means everyone, the normal vectors are running in the same direction. Do you agree? Uh -huh. That means the normal vectors, each one of those vectors that are normal planes, have to be scalar multiples of each other. So what we'll do is, to determine whether or not they're parallel, we're just going to look at this, the ratios, to make sure they're all equivalent in front of the x, y, and z. So I'm going to put down the word, check the ratios. Make sure all the ratios, this over this must equal this over this, must equal that over that. And that would mean they're all what? Parallel. Cool. Now, do you have to do the ratio of 11 and 23? Would you have to check that ratio? No. Because where's the normal vectors? They're always the coefficients to the what? The x and the y and the z. Right, everyone? So that when, we when I say check ratios, I mean just look in front of these and make sure they're all equal. So first of all, are these planes parallel? Uh, no way, because it's 2, 6 equal to a 5 over negative 1. What do you all think? No. <laughs> right? Plus it would have to equal the what? The negative 1. I mean, are these equal? No. Then it's not what? Definitely not parallel planes. But are they perpendicular? If nine of these hold, then we've got to say neither. Evan, what would be the dot product of the normal vectors? Do you see it? Two times a what? Six. Plus? Five times negative one. Plus? Negative one uh, times seven. And don't do these. Remember we said that? What do you get? What's the answer? I'll give you one more.
I do this for emphasis, everyone. We don't want. We don't care. We only care about those when we go into these questions. We're just looking at what's going on with these normal vectors to the planes. Are they parallel, perpendicular, zero? Well, let me check the dot product real quick. 12 plus 75 plus 3. No, that's not zero. <laughs> and they're parallel. Because what's going on with these ratios? One 2, 6 is equivalent to negative 5 over a negative 15, which is equivalent to a. And when these would be parallel. The two planes are parallel. Cool. Now, what if neither of those hold? Neither. Neither. Okay, the rest of class, we get to do 12.6. Now, this is fun. Now, I think I missed a couple of people. I'm just going to bring you a sheet. This is fun. This is the cylinders and quadrant surfaces. I'm going to get chalk on this. Here you go. Who else didn't get a cop? Oh, here you go. One of those things is in the textbook, but it just gives a copy of the cylinders. So when we're going to draw some cylinders and quadrant surfaces in three-dimensional space. This is fun. Because all the sketches you did before this, I haven't met you bad. I mean, thanks. Like we're going to sketch things like this. What's this section called? This is titled. For 12.6, surfaces. Now, I'm going to write that on the board. They actually title it cylinders and surfaces. You get there. Cylinders and quadric surfaces. You see that title? I am just going to put it, the word surfaces here for now because a cylinder really is a surface. All right, and when you think of a trash can, it's, that's a cylinder. Think of a trash can. Is there a surface to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that's a surface too. But cylinders are very specific, so I'll make sure you understand it in notes. But we can just title this what? Surfaces, right? So by me just titling the surfaces, Did I just give you an equation of a plane? Yes. There's no x squared or y squared or z squared in there, right? That's the equation of a plane. How would you sketch a plane? Now, I'll be honest, this question isn't asked in 12.6. This is asked in 12.5. I just thought I would show it to you now. And when they want us to sketch this plane. All right. I think the easiest way is using intercepts. Will that work? So can we use intercepts? Mm -hmm. And what would be an x-intercept? The y and the z would have to be what? Zero. So would you make those zeros? So hi, Dad. What would have to be the x value of a point on that point? Four. 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 That one's We'll just make, we'll find the three intercepts and plot them in that thing and we'll be done. We'll connect them. It's going to look like a triangle, but it would be a sketch. All right, how about a y intercept? Y intercept, the z and the what? X is zero. All right, with y? Two. Two. We need one more point. How about the z intercept? Eight. That would mean this is a zero and this is a zero. Let me hide those. What is it? Well, let's, what would this plane look like? Go up eight notches, put a dot. Go over two notches, put a dot. And then go down this x axis, everyone. Put a dot and then just do what? I know it looks like a triangle, but this triangle would go on what? Infinitely? Yeah, we just got an idea of this slanted. It's, it's got that slant there. Chapter 15, everyone will form a tetrahedron out of this thing and find a volume. It's fun. We just do, um, remember integrals? Calc 1? Integrals in Calc 2? We just do double and triple integrals. Is it hard? No. You just do the integral twice. That's not hard at all. But that's how we'll find, like, get the volume of the tetrahedron formed by this. But to get it started, you're going to have to draw a picture. Does that make sense? Well, that's, that's a point. But how about silk? So let's start with cylinders first. Cylinders, everyone, would you make a note? You're going to only see two variables. You will only see two variables. So no two three. letters. If you don't like the word variables, two letters. Here's an example. I want you and I are going to sketch this. 
in three space. Now I have to emphasize everyone, I'm saying three dimensional space. Because look what I'm writing. X squared plus Y squared equals four. And when if you think about it, if I didn't say in three dimensional space, if I wasn't specific about that, I think you all are thinking about a circle, aren't you? Mm -hmm. That's the equation of a circle in two dimensional space. So I do have to be very clear when I ask you to do this. I would have to say, would you make this sketch in what? <laughs> three dimensional space. But do you notice how many letters there are? Two. That's when you know you got a cylinder. Okay? Whoops. I can't say it's always the case because everyone, the plane, what if one of the coefficients to the plane is zero? Then you only have two letters. But usually when you see these two letters, you're thinking, oh, this is a cylinder. Okay? So now we're going to sketch this. You know, it's not a circle. No, because it's in three dimensional space. Well, what letter is missing? Z. Would you make a note about this? That means Z is anything. That's what it means. Z can take on any value. That's what it means in three space. It doesn't mean it equals zero. It could be zero. But Z can be any value, is what we're saying. X and Y have to hold net true, hold true in this relationship. But Z can take on what? Any value. Any value. I'll do that one next. I love her question. She goes, what if you're given X and Z? We'll do that one right after this. So I thought I would start with this. You're given X and Y. And I went, isn't that, we're thinking like a circle, right? What would be the radius? Two. Two and then when, here's the X axis. Here's the Y axis. And there's the Z axis. So when I'm thinking, okay, I could just make a circle here with the radius of two, right? No one see it? Uh-huh. Well, what letter was missing? Z. So I said Z could be anything. So can you get, a, get an idea of what this is going to form? Because infinitely I can make these circles this way. Because Z can take on any value. And what's it turn into? Cylinder. A cylinder. And where's this cylinder centered? Z Z yeah, around the Z axis. Let me make sure I'm going to center that thing. I'll get it right smack dab in the middle, right? It'll be centered right on that Z axis. I think that's far enough. Would this just keep going forever? Uh -huh. If you want to put words down, you can say the radius is two. It's the same. Now, but when I'm talking about the surface, I'm talking about all the points on the what? On the edge of the surface. That's what I want to point out. All the points that are sitting on the surface. What about the top? Well, this went on infinitely. There is no top. True? Now, if you're like, yeah, but I want to talk about all the points inside of it. Oh, all you have to do is go up here and go like that. <laughs> I'm going to erase that, but do you agree? Uh -huh. Now you're talking about everything on the surface and what? Inside of it. You just filled it up with like water. But right now I'm just talking about the points on the surface. So now I'm going to your point. Let's do another so. How about x squared plus z squared? Um, yeah, I like perfect squares, so why don't we do 9? When that is cylinder, it's in 3 space. Which letter's missing? Y. So where do you think it's centered? Y -axis. So it's going to be centered on this y axis. And what's the radius? Mm -hmm. work. I just want everyone you'll notice in the notes, I wanted to just at least give you one example of that. Right? The software I use to make those sketches, so those cylinders, it's called Winplot. It's free software if you want to download it yourself and look at these sketches. Because it is fun. It's kind of fun to twist it because it allows you to look inside it and twist it around. I can look down through this end if you're doing something in design. Have I ever used this to help a company uh, maybe do something? And you'd be like, he's a math teacher. I actually have. I use it just to design because they have stuff and I go, I can, I can make that with one plot and kind of get an idea of what you got there. Give you a nice sketch. Well, they're not all perfectly, this, these were circular <laughs> cylinders, right? Well, then what the heck is this? It's my nephew. Square picture? That's still a cylinder, it's just not a circular cylinder. Do you know what that does to a circle? Sphere. Uh, not a sphere. Okay. Sphere's coming up, though. I heard ellipse. Right. When a circle, when the coefficients of the x and y are always the same, what if one's off a little bit? You know, one's a one, but the other one's a what? Nine. nine. It makes it more like an oval in two-dimensional space. They call it an ellipse. So this is still a cylinder. It's just not a perfect circular cylinder. It's more like an elliptical cylinder. 
All right? What I mean, it's got what? Rather than being a total circle and going up right here, it's more like what? Like a donut. Yeah, and then it goes like this forever, right? Like someone got all mad and they took the trash can and what? Gotcha. And they squished it. And that's what came out of it, true? Well, if I wanted to make a sketch of this, you sure can. I use the intercepts. That's what I do. So I'm curious, everyone. What if, uh, in this equation, what if x was 0? What would z have to be? Remember, I'm just going to, everyone, since I just want to get one point going on, I'm going to let y equal 0. Is that cool? What would z have to be? 3. And I'll put plus or minus 3. Do you agree? Uh-huh. Okay, so that would mean, okay, it would have to be stretched out. Three, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> 3 on the what? The z axis, then I can go down what? There you go. Three up that way, three that way. I need another intercept. Well, in this time, let the z and the y be zero. Plus see, minus one. See how quick you are? Wouldn't x have to be plus or minus one? Don't see that? So which way was it more elongated? Yeah, look at this. See, it's like you said, the squished. It's all squished. It's an ellipse here. But now it turns into a what? <laughs> an elliptical what? One off, you're like, yeah, it's just elliptical. It looks on the side, it looks kind of like a football. <laughs> That's right. That goes on forever. Yep. <laughs> I know, sometimes I'm trying to think of this thing. It's like, okay, make it more circular with your folder. Okay, that's more like the circular cylinder, right? Right? But now that thing is more what? <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm trying to make it more elliptical. It's like taking that and squishing it. That's what's going on. It's still a cylinder. Well, are they all like circles or ellipses? Eh. Nah. <clears throat> Anybody ever see that half pipe at the Olympics? So let me talk about this. Um, okay. And let me say, I want you to sketch this surface, but let me be careful. If I just said this, you might just draw it in the XY plane, right? I need you to sketch this in 3D. three dimensional space, in 3D space. And in three dimensional space, I need you to sketch this. Which letter is missing? Z. It means Z can be anything. So let's see what this looks like. It's much clearer. Like, have you ever seen that half pipe at the Olympic? Look, there's the y axis, there's the x axis. Wouldn't a parabola everyone for y equals x squared just kind of come out like this? Like that? Mm -hmm. You know, there's the y axis, there's the x axis. We'd be sitting down there in the xy plane for y equals x squared, right? But we said z could be what? Anything. So I'm just, I need you to ride up a line. Just go stay parallel to that z axis. I can stay more straight. Let me do it again. Ride it up. And would you duplicate that trace right there? Just go up here and just kind of go. I hit the axis, I'll come back. Yeah. If you want to shade it in, you can. Does everyone see it's like a half pipe? From the upside down? You want to give it some color. Does everyone see it? And in that case, it's the lowest point is the axis. And this could go on forever though, do you agree? Yeah. This thing would go on forever. That's it. And you go, what is this called? It's a cylinder. Well, what's the adjective? Parabolic. So it's a parabolic cylinder. Um, but have you ever seen those in the Olympics? The Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. I don't know, unless, do they have skateboarding in the uh, Summer Olympics? I don't know. A lot, I mean, I remember, my, you know, my local towns, uh, someone on one of the streets built one of these. Like right in the front yard. Like, like they seriously, it was out there. And it was just sitting there and all these, they'd go out there every day with their skateboards. It's like a just magnet like, inside a motor. Yep. And it would just like, to, I also like to have this, I wish something like this could form in front of my house when there's high wind days. <laughs> Actually, my backyard, because the wind comes through my backyard. I would love that. It would just take all the wind and what? Save me a ton on my, my electrical bill. Just like I press a button and what would come up? Just come out of the grass. I'm still waiting for someone to design that for me. My neighbors will get mad. It's going to push all the wind towards them, right? Cool. All right, so that's a parabolic cylinder. So we got cylinders, but hey, one more. How about, um, Z 
Z equals Y squared plus 2. Oh, wait. Let me do one more thing. Negative. Z equals negative Y squared plus 2. How many letters? Two. Two letters. Three-dimensional space, right? But negative, what did you do to the parabola? Flipped it. What's the plus 2 do? Move it up two notches. And X is missing, so X is going to be anything, right? Well, here's the Y axis. Here's the Z axis, right? So I'm thinking, what happened? Well, Z equals, here's Z equals Y, right? It's almost like Y equals X squared. There's the Z axis, Y axis. You can think like, remember Y equal to X squared? Now I have what? Z equals Y squared. Well, there's the Z, there's the ZY plane. Went up two and it went. It flipped what? It flipped over. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, there's a nice trade. Everyone see how I went up two notches, inverted it? But what's missing? X, so I can run parallel lines to the what? The X axis, and then do another trace like this. So right off here, just, just run parallel to the X axis. These are fun to make. You can go run and keep running. Now would you repeat this trace? What would it do? It'll just what? I'll go up, then I'll what? Come down, we get that to connect there. Sometimes you gotta extend it, just stay parallel to that X axis. It's just another parabolic cylinder, right? Cool. Hey, if you want to shade it in, you can. Now, you've probably seen things like this before, right? Have you walked under things like this? Some type of design. I mean, we can download WinBot. It's free software to do this stuff. All right, what's next? The last that we're doing are quadric surfaces. These were called what? How many letters did cylinders have? Last thing, quadric surfaces. And we actually have enough time to do this. Quadric surfaces. How many letters? Three variables. They will always have three variables. What did you say? They will always have three letters. That's the way you know it's not a cylinder. So can we all start with the most popular of this guy? X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals 4. That's the one we saw in the first day of class. Except I put an H, K, and L with it, but we're just talking about a simple one. You know what that is? That's the sphere. We saw last class. That's a sphere. Where's its center? Zero. At the origin? At the origin, what's the radius? Two. Two? And when you just want it, you can draw a picture of it. Just make like a basketball here, you can swing it around, doesn't have to be too big, but you know the radius is equal to what? But you know that's a what? Two. So right off that problem, we got to go to something that's very close to this, but it's not a perfect sphere. I mean, basketball, it's a sphere, right? A football, is that a sphere? No. no. So what would happen if you had like x squared plus 4y squared plus 9z squared, and let's just say it equaled 1. You know? Let's just say it equaled 1. Well, that's not a sphere. This is an ellipsoid. We've got to put some other words down to help us understand this. All I did with that basketball that was perfectly nice and neat was squish it. <laughs> and it turned into a what? Uh, a blimp? Think of a blimp. That's an ellipsoid. A football, is that an ellipsoid? Absolutely. So if you add like three coefficients uh, to a sphere, it becomes an ellipsoid? That's right. Okay. You got it. If these were all the same, it turns into what? A sphere. sphere. Now, when this is going to be more elongated around one axis, do you all agree? Mm -hmm. Do you want to figure out how to do this? I always use the intercepts. So what if y and z were zero? 
What would X have to be? Plus minus one. Okay. Just to see which way it's more squished. <laughs> what if X and Y were zeros? I love it. Plus or minus a third. And what if these are zeros? Plus or minus one half. There you go. So which way is it more elongated? More along the x axis. X axis. I'll go one away, one away. The y axis, it's what? It's going up a half. Right? Whoops, I just did the z. So it's going one half on the y axis. But how far is it going up on the z axis? Just a third. So I'm going to go like a third. And you can just go connect all this stuff like this, like, and then just go, and you're trying to form that what? That blimp, that ellipsoid. You want to make more circles in there, that's what you got. All right. So the next couple, can you just swing that door closed? All right. Hey, almost done. These next two, we've got two things that look very close to each other. So I'm putting them right next to each other. Let's pair these up. How many variables? Three. Quadric surface. You go, well, are these shares? No, I don't see the equals four thing, right? I don't see the equals one or the equals nine. So these are not spheres. I'm going to start with this one. Is this a cylinder? No, because the cylinder only has how many letters? Two. Two letters. So, to help us understand this, I'm going to hide this. And I want you to think about that in algebra class. What was that? So this should act like a parabola. Does everyone find this? This is the way you'll never mess it up and recognize it. You know this must act like a parabola. That's why it's going to be a paraboloid. <laughs> now, which axis is the paraboloid going to be centered on? The letter that's isolated. Okay? So what I need you to do is just, yeah, form up from that z-axis, but now you've got to form a circle somewhere, because it's going to just keep opening up and opening up. So would you form like some circle somewhere? It's open-ended. It'll just keep going forever. It's called an open surface. It'll never stop what? Open enough. Does that make sense? But that's good enough. It's called a paraboloid. Have you ever seen a windsock? Paraboloid. Paraboloid. All right. Now, come over here. When that was the z-axis. By the way, that's a circular paraboloid. What if this had a four there and that was a one? Elliptical paraboloid. That was awesome. That's what it would be. It'd still be a paraboloid. It would just be what? Elliptical. Well, I'm over here. This looks like it's circular, but I'm not making sense of it. I know it's not a paraboloid, so I'm going to hide this, and I'm thinking of algebra. Well, if I square root both sides, you know what I get? I get plus or minus an x. So I'm thinking in algebra, everyone, if z equals plus or minus an x, that's, that would be like this. Now, i got to think of that if it goes circular in three-dimensional space. It starts with a c, and it turns into a what? A cone. Does that help? That's how I gotta think. I'm like, that in two-dimensional space would do that, right? But I gotta think this is gonna circular, be circular forever in three-dimensional space. What's it gonna turn into? Cones. Hmm. Like a double cone? It's gonna be a double cone. So different from a paraboloid, which kind of opens up like this first, this is just gonna what? And where is it centered? Which axis? Z. Whichever letter is right there. I just thought I'd push one. Now everyone, what if this was, hey, I can go off to the side here. What if this was y squared equals x squared plus z squared? Where's the double cone centered? Y. So you would just be making a cone on, you'd be like, right? So it comes out like that. And it's always circular unless they put a four and a one there. And if it was like the quotient like y minus two squared equals x squared plus z squared? Jeez, you won't even see that. I love that. I love how you're thinking more advanced. You go, we always get just get this. I, I want to point something out too. This is usually used for design, everyone. 
and you usually don't have a double, you just have what? Let me see, it's like a tank and they're pouring what? Oil in here or something. So a lot of times they'll make, right up here they'll go, let Z be greater than or equal to zero. What does that mean? It's only the top. The top. So I just want to point that out. That's really what you usually have, and it's usually for, you know, there are conical reservoirs and things like that. Cool. All right. And the next two, we'll put them together. This will wrap it up. What if it looks like the sphere? One of them's a minus. Put one over here too. Now, when don't these both look like spheres? Don't they both look like spheres? Mm -hmm. Cool. But this has how many minuses? One. Looks like the sphere, but has one minus. It's called a hyperboloid. Sheet. Hey, this looks like the sphere, but it's got minuses in there. How many minuses? Two. This is called a hyperboloid two, of two sheets. Two sheets. All right, we need some words to help us remember what these look like. Everyone, have you ever seen the cooling towers at a nuclear power plant? Uh -huh. Your textbook author, I have to show you this. That's exactly what he used. If you can see it from here. You can see those cooling towers, like at Three Mile Island up in PA. You don't see the cooling towers. That's exactly what he put. He put that picture right in this section. And that's what a hyperbola of one sheet is. So I want you to think nuclear power plant. Look at those cooling towers. Now, when I make this cooling tower, it's pretty cool. Because it's going to bend. It's going to bend like the hyperbola. It's going to bend in and bend out. Y-axis, Z-axis. Uh, whoops, X-axis, Z-axis. What we're concerned about is where's its center. Now, when which one had the minus as the coefficient? That's where it's going to be centered. Wherever that one minus is, is at the coefficient to the variable, that's the axis where it's going to be centered. So all I'm going to do is, is build my little cooling tower, bend in, and then I'll bend out. And it just keeps opening up forever, and it would open and open forever and ever and ever. That'll work. By the way, if you're curious, like how far close does, does it get to a one point? Now, when in the xy plane, this would have a radius of one. I can prove it to you. Because in the xy plane, z would equal zero. And do you see it? There's like a circle, radius one, right around there when it hits the xy plane. So it bends in, it gets really close, but it'd have a radius of one. And that would be the narrowest it gets. That's the narrowest this gets. And how about this guy? How many minuses? Two. Two sheets. But which letter? didn't have the minus. Right. This is where it's going to be centered. See here it was centered on the minus, it's going to be centered where there is no minus. And this looks like two little like, almost like paraboloids, or a little like satellite dishes. And there's a satellite dish right here. No one can see that. There's a satellite dish, except this will form two along the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is I want to go distance it will be one away from the origin. I'm just going to open up a little satellite dish like this. Just go like that. It's like a little parabola. And then I'll go on the other side to make the other one. That's what they mean by two sheets. And it would just keep opening everyone. I did have to extend this x-axis to get my other one. This would be exactly one unit away. Okay? One unit away from that origin. And this would open up this way and this would open up that way. If you're like, I don't like your picture so much, where can you see some really good pictures? See them then? Or you can draw them in wind plot if you want. Hey, there's one last one that I never, ever make you draw because I hate drawing them too. I think it's the hardest one to draw. Look in the lower left corner of this sheet. What's it called? It's like a saddle, everyone. It looks like a saddle. What is that thing? A hyperbolic. Hyperbolic. I'll just put hype and then put paraboloid. I don't ever make you sketch this, but it looks like the paraboloid before, except what was between these two variables? Not a plus, a what? A minus. So that's the one you can just say, oh good, I don't know, he's never gonna make me sketch that thing. A lot of times I like to do matching anyway. That sound cool? Hey, I wanted to leave some time at the end, everyone. You have a great weekend. Uh, problem sets do what? 
Yeah, new Tuesday. If you have questions, let me know. Stick around. Hope you all have a great weekend. Super job.